Hi everyone, I'm Saeed Sedigin of TTIC and this is a joint work with François Lagal of Nagoya University. So at the time we started this project, the question that we had in mind was try, we were trying to make a connection between quantum algorithms and fine-grained problems. So of course in fine-grained complexity we consider these very basic and uh, fundamental problems such as LCS, edit distance, knapsack, subset sum, pattern matching, etc. The thing that all these problems have in common is that they're really simple. The algorithms are very easy and straightforward. The question that we try to answer is whether these very simple algorithms are optimal or can we improve the runtime for them. Sometimes we can prove lower bounds, sometimes turns out a better algorithm exists. In quantum complexity, we try to take advantage of quantum physics and improve the algorithms in terms of runtime. It seems to be possible to make quantum computers in practice. Right now, Google, Microsoft, and many other companies are making quantum computers. These quantum computers are not, a strong, are not very strong. They only have hundreds of qubits. But they seem to be strong enough to, to claim quantum supremacy. What Google claimed a few years ago was that there is a quantum algorithm running on one of its quantum computers. It can solve the problem. But the equivalent classic algorithm, if you, if, you, if you run it on any supercomputer, it would take a long time. Because of the advantage that quantum algorithms have, we expect that some of these problems can be solved faster. For example, there is a list of problems that we can solve exponentially faster. There are many problems that we can solve polynomially faster. And there are, of course, some problems that we know we cannot do anything uh, better than the classic algorithms. The question that we asked in this work is where exactly each of these fine-grained problems is that. Can we improve the runtime for them, or can we prove there is no speed up for them? This is an interesting question because there is a big difference between these two areas. In quantum complexity, we usually go, go very low level to design algorithms. Sometimes we draw circuits. In fine-grained complexity, we look at everything at a very high level. We look at the existing algorithms as black box, and then we reduce other problems to them to either give new algorithms or to give lower bounds. Um, I can tell you a little bit about their basics. For example, there are many conjectures in uh, fine-grained complexity. One of them is APSP, which says a graph of size n, we cannot find the distance between every pair of them in truly subcubic time. Or there is SETH, or a strong exponential time hypothesis. It says that SAT cannot be solved in time 2 to the n times 1 minus epsilon. Or there is another conjecture, max plus convolution. It says that if you're given two sequences of size n, computing the combinatorial convolution takes at least quadratic time. Now what we do is we look at these conjectures, we use them as basis, and then based on them we prove lower bounds for other problems. For example, one of them which is very famous is the work on edit distance. If we solve edit distance in truly subquadratic time, we can look at that algorithm as a black box, come up with a better algorithm for SETH, uh, for, for SAT, which is inconsistent with SETH. So if you believe in SETH, then it means that there is no better algorithm for edit distance. Of course, in quantum, we improve the runtimes. Uh, there are some very famous problems that we can solve faster. Unordered search is one of them. Given a 0, 1 sequence of size n, we are looking for one element with value 1. Of course, classically, we have to look at everything so that requires linear time. Grover's algorithm, which is a quantum algorithm, solves it for us in time root n. The second problem is element distinctness. Um, there are many variants for it. The variant that I work with in this talk has two separate lists of size n. We want to know if there is one element which is shared between them. Again, that problem requires omega of n time if you want to solve it classically, but turns out in quant with a quantum algorithm, we can solve it in time n to the two third. And finally, pattern matching. This is a very famous problem. Given a text and a pattern, we want to know if the pattern appears in the text as a sub, sub string. 
assuming that the lengths of the pattern and the text um, are bounded by n, um, we can solve it in linear time. And of course, we need to spend linear time to solve it classically. But turns out with the quantum algorithm, we can, we can do that in time root n. What we had in mind for the project is the following. We wanted to merge these two areas. We wanted to use the techniques of um, fine-grained complexity. But instead of looking at the existing classic algorithms as black box, we replace that by the existing quantum algorithms. So everything is going to be classic. But in the end, the algorithms we obtain are going to be quantum because the algorithms we started with as black box, those are quantum algorithms. So this way, we can come up with better and better quantum algorithms for, for these problems. The two problems that we consider are LPS and LCS. In LPS, we are given a sequence of size n. We want to find the largest substring, which is palindrome. And a string is palindrome if it reads the same both forwards and backwards, meaning that the first character is equal to the last character, the second character is equal to the second to last character, and so on. So given a string, find a substring which reads um, the same both forward and backward. Find the largest substring of that string that has that property. That is LPS. LCS, first of all, it's for the longest common substring problem. There is also another problem which is called longest common subsequence. The, between, the difference between these two problems is that in a subsequence, we allow for gaps between the characters. In substring, everything has to be next to each other. So here we are considering longest common substring, and because of that, in the solution, the characters have to be next to each other. So what is the problem? Given two strings of lengths n, we want to find a substring which is shared between them. And of course, among such substrings, we want to find the largest one. Question is, what's the size of the largest substring that has that property? The reason we consider these two problems is that they're pretty much equivalent in the classic setting. In other words, um, we can solve both of them in linear time. The algorithm for both of them uses suffix three, and it's basically the same thing, except that one line of the code is different between them. So for both of them, we read the input, we make a suffix tree, we find one of the nodes that gives us a solution for LCS. If we find another node that gives us a solution for LPS. So pretty much everything is the same for both of them. Our conceptual contribution is that the situation changes in the quantum setting. We first show that both of the problems can be solved in sublinear time. For LPS, our algorithm runs in time root n. For LCS, it runs in time n to the 5, 6. And I'm ignoring all the polylog factors for now. We also give lower bounds. The lower bound for LPS is root n. The lower bound for LCS is n to the 2 third. And what the combination of these results show is that there is a difference between LCS and LPS. Because LPS, we show we can solve in time root n. But there is an unconditional lower bound of n to the 2 third for LCS. So the two problems are definitely not equivalent in the quantum setting. All right, um, in the remainder of this talk, I briefly tell you the overall ideas of getting a solution for LCS. Actually, the solution for LC L LPS follows from the same ideas, um, so I don't mention that explicitly. OK. Of course, for all of the problems like this, the first step is to do a binary search on the solution size. So instead of maximizing the size of the common substring, we assume there is an extra parameter d given to us. We just want to know if there is a solution of size d. If there is such a solution, we output yes. If there is no such solution, we output no. Turns out we just need to do a binary search on d and, and maximize d. So from here on, we just want to know if there is a solution of size d. For that purpose, we design two separate algorithms. The former works well when the value of d is small. The latter works well when the value of d is large. So the complexity of the first algorithm is n to the 2 third times root d. And the complexity of the second one is n over root d. Now, if d is bounded by n to the 1 6, 
we run the first algorithm, otherwise we run the second algorithm, you can do the math. In the worst case, the runtime is going to be bounded by n to the power 6. I'll start with the simpler algorithm, which is for the lower d. Um, OK, so generally, the goal is to find a pair ij such that the substrings starting from the position i of the first string and starting from the position j of the second string are equal. That means that ai is equal to bj, ai plus 1 is equal to bj plus 1, all the way to ai plus, AI plus d minus 1 is equal to bj plus d minus 1. You can break that into two subtasks. The first subtask is to just verify that for an i and j. So let's say i and j are given. We want to know if, if the substring is starting at i and j are equal. Classically, that requires time O of d because we have to go over all of the indices one by one. With Grover's algorithm, we can improve that to root d. Just think of this as follows. Make this um, sequence of size d. If the ice element of this sequence is equal to zero, it means that the ice element of the substring is equal are, are equal, and otherwise it means that the ice elements are different. Now we want to know if there is one element in this sequence which is equal to one. Grover's allows us to, to, to find that in time root n. Root, root n, in this case, the size of the sequence is d, so the overall runtime would be root d. Now we can reduce the problem to element distinctness. Put every substring of size d of the first string into a list x, and then every substring of size d of the second string into a list y. We want to know if there is one element shared between x and y. That we can do in time n to the 2 third. But on top of that, we have to pay a price for comparing these elements. The comparison time is root d. So the overall runtime when merging these two algorithms would be equal to n to the 2 third times root d. OK, so that does it for the first algorithm. The second algorithm is a little bit more complicated. So what I'm going to tell you is how we can get a 1 minus epsilon approximation for the larger values of d. Then I briefly tell you the idea for turning that into an exact algorithm. OK, so the 1 minus epsilon approximation is really straightforward. Just subsample a substring s of lengths 1 minus epsilon d from one of the strings. Then run the pattern matching algorithm and figure out whether this uh, substring appears in the second string. If, if it does appear, output yes. If it doesn't appear, output no. Now let's look at this algorithm. It definitely loses an approximation factor of 1 minus epsilon. Because if it outputs yes, we, we just know that there is a common substring of size 1 minus epsilon d. The runtime is going to be root n, because we just run pattern matching and, take, and that takes root n time. The success probability is pretty low. We know the lower bound on the number of size solutions is epsilon d over n, which is omega of d over n. So the, the only guarantee that we can say here is that there is omega of d over n probability that this algorithm works. To improve the success probability, we can bring in amplitude amplification. It, it improves the success probability to pretty close to 1. But then it comes at a hit on the runtime. Instead of runtime root n, now we are going to have runtime n over root d. And still, the approximation factor is going to be 1 minus epsilon. OK. So that does it for the second algorithm. but we're still losing an approximation factor of 1 minus epsilon. To resolve that, I just um, mentioned this thought experiment. Let's say the solution is unique. There is one substring of lengths d which is shared between the two strings, and there is nothing else which is common between them. So in that case, if, even if you find a 1 minus epsilon approximation, we just need to extend it from both ends. And that pretty much leads us to the exact solution. The issue is for the case that there are multiple solutions. Some of them have size d. Some of them have size more than 1 minus epsilon d, but smaller than d. 
So sometimes we start from the wrong place, we extend it from both ends, but we don't get to the actual solution. What we prove in the paper is that that only happens if the strings are periodic, meaning that they're repeating themselves. And then for the periodic setting, we prove that there is an alternative algorithm that, does, that solves the problem and runs in time n over root d. Okay, um, so the combination of these ideas gives us a solution that runs in time n to the 5, 6. It solves LCS and it uh, does it with high probability. There's also a trivial lower bound that directly follows from element distinctness. Um, we can think of LCS as a, you know, a strict generaliz generalization of element distinctness. If the solution to LCS is zero, it means that the two sequences have nothing in common. If it's at least one, it means that the two sequences have something in common. So LCS definitely solves element distinctness. And therefore, the lower bound and element distinctness also carries over to LCS, which means that uh, LCS requires time n to the two thirds. Um, I just want to wrap up by just mentioning a, f a subsequent work that actually improves our algorithm for LCS. Their algorithm is actually tight. The runtime is n to the two thirds, which matches the lower bound that we give. So, um, else the, the upper bound and the lower bound for LCS are pretty much. Um, uh, close together up to polylogarithmic factor is tight and we can solve it in time n to two thirds and then for the LPS problem also um, uh, everything is tight. Finally one open question um, I guess the idea of this work was to answer um, you know it, it was to find out the quantum complexity of fine grain problems. The very interesting question is about the quantum complexity of edit distance and longest common subsequence. Classically, we know that they require quadratic time because of a reduction to SETH. Um, to be more precise, the reduction goes through an intermediary problem, which is called orthogonal vector. Uh, we know that in the classic setting, orthogonal vector requires quadratic time unless CES fails. The interesting thing is that orthogonal vector we can actually solve in linear time for quantum. So the reduction wouldn't work for quantum. Yet, we don't know any better algorithm for either any edit distance or LCS. So there could be two things. Either we could give a better lower bound through another problem, which cannot be solved in linear time for quantum. That would be very interesting. Or it could be the case that we can actually improve the runtime for any of these problems.